We on now? We're alive. Howdy, folks. Welcome to the 24th annual Fisher Poets Gathering. Saturday night, first set. Uh, just a little background. Actually, the theme for tonight's performance is up close and virtual. We'll uh, hopefully get back to up close and personal before too long, but we're, we're all missing you. I'm sitting here in Gearhart, Oregon. Um, as it, John is a little south of me down on, in Cannon Beach, and Amanda is in Astoria, um, and a number of other people keeping this moving. We've been doing this a long time. This is the first time we've tried to do it virtually. I hope some of you have already um, attended. We're proud and happy that you're all here, and I uh, hope you'll enjoy what we've got for you tonight. Um, so I'm going to just give you a little bit of uh, background. We've done this, as I said, for 25 years, and uh, 19, actually 1998 was the first performance. And uh, we will uh, go back into our live performances as soon as we can. I'll read you a list of those uh, that are wishing that we were in their houses tonight. Uh, normally, we've, we've lately been running seven stages on two nights. Those would include Astoria Brewing Company, which was the for former Wet Dog Cafe where it all started, Cala Gallery, Columbian Theater, Liberty Theater, Fort George Level Showroom, the Voodoo Room, 1015 Theater, Winecraft, Plaza Community College uh, hosting uh, workshops, and uh, Pier 39 for our farewell. Uh, that would be the Hanthorn Museum. And the sometimes we've used the Columbia River Maritime Museum as well. So I'm sure that some of those people are missing us tonight. And uh, we hope that we can get back there soon. Some of our sponsors, I should mention, are KMUN Coast Community Radio, City of Astoria, Hip Fish Monthly, Coast Weekend, and the Astorian Alfred Landwer, Judy and Milt Stewart, Michelle Ab Abramson, Jonathan White, Patricia Freeland Fund, and the Oregon Community Foundation, Clatsop Community College, Oregon Folklife Network, Astoria Warrington Chamber of Commerce, Astoria Downtown Historic District Association, and of course the Oregon Sea Grant Program, of which Amanda is a, a colleague and has an, they've been generous enough to provide the platform for this uh, Zoom webinar. We also have Jamie Doyle and Megan Claybacker who are our stage managers. So without further ado, I would like to introduce the Souls of the Sea from Gloucester, Massachusetts. These folks came out uh, a few years ago. I think we've had them twice and we uh, are going to run a pre-recorded piece from them. So here they are, Souls of the Sea. Hey everybody, Alan Estes from Souls of the Sea. I'm here at Gloucester Harbor because we can't be with you in Astoria, Oregon this year. Uh, Gloucester and Astoria have a common culture which is commercial fishing. And we love to celebrate that wonderful culture and song and verse and stories. Today we would like to share our side of the culture here in Gloucester. And uh, we prepared a short video history of our community and then a performance of one of our most popular songs, Not With Your Hands, a song about the courageous Gloucester fisherman named Howard Blackburn. So enjoy your virtual gathering this year. Thank you, John Jay, all the other ones for your extraordinary efforts and we'll see you next year in Astoria. This is the story of America, the story of Gloucester, Massachusetts. Founded by a tough breed of daring individuals, Gloucester is America's oldest seaport, from where the intrepid Gloucestermen hunt the treacherous North Atlantic for sustenance and commercial success. For centuries, they've found success, great success, supplying the nation with the fruits of their bone-bruising labor, the halibut, 
the cod, the haddock. But their achievement has come at great cost. 10,000 Gloucester fishermen lost at sea. 10,000 Gloucester fishermen lost in a continuous 400-year war with the ocean. The generations of courageous men and women who have lived, triumphed, suffered, and sustained this legacy are the essence of the story of Gloucester and the story of America. My name's Howard Blackburn. I was lost for days at sea in a winter storm with a trawling maid in 1883. With frostbit hands I rode from land 60 miles away Poor Tom before he froze to death had nothing good to say He said, hi, word, you won't make it to shore There ain't no power in your hands anymore But I said one thing, this survivor understands You roll with your heart, not with your hands You roll Thanks to Alan and all the boys back there. Hope you guys are staying warm. It's great to see your face and hear your music. Thanks to Frank Tedesco who uh, set this up for us. And uh, we sure miss you. We'll be back there someday. Maybe you guys will make it out here. So next in line, we've got a guy that uh, has been around the ocean a little bit. Uh, been here, coming here for years to the Fisher Poets Gathering. David Bean has fished albacore offshore out of Mexico years ago. Uh, fished black cod, salmon in Southeast 70s and the 90s. And more recently worked removing dams on the White Salmon River, which sounds like a worthy cause to me. So welcome, David Bean. Well, thank you. And thanks to uh... 
John, Amanda, Florence, Hobie, and everybody who makes this the high point of my year, um, along with the audience, which is the best. So here we go. There was a oil spill near Richmond Long Wharf two weeks ago on February 10th, 600 gallons. It made the papers. Little bursts of oil like that did not usually get noticed. It got me thinking. We all remember the Exxon Valdez spill in 89, belching nine million gallons of crude into the Prince William Sound. Well, just about a month and 50 years ago was the Bolina spill when the Arizona Standard T-boned her sister vessel, the Oregon Standard, 300 yards outside the Golden Gate on an outgoing tide in 1971. They blackened the North Coast with the, from the Golden Gate to Bolinas with 800,000 gallons of crude. Two standard oil vessels kissing in the night. Now, as a boy from my bedroom window growing up, I could see the Richmond Long Wharf and those very ships going to and fro. Later, after being a bait boy on a puker and pulling albacore all summer on a longliner, all before graduating from high school, I then shipped out on the Washington Standard in 1964. After sailing about six months of milk runs between Richmond and Moss Landing, Moss Landing and Richmond, we finally went out into the deep blue of Hawaii and then to Alaska. Wow, now we're talking. This is why I shipped out. But on the second trip back from Kenai laden with crude, a gale caught us in the Gulf of Alaska and we split a seam. Rough weather, 60 foot waves, the bow of that 475 foot T2 tanker thrusting into the sky and then burying its nose into the next wave as the stern was lifted high. You could hear the wheel thump, thump, thump as the blades re-entered the sea and bogged as they took a bite. Fortunately, the split in the seam was kind of above the waterline within the port side head. I say kind of, because it would be above the plimsoll line if we were stationary, but we were rocking. When that ship rolled to port, it submerged in an inch wide seam, six foot tall jet of water would stream through the center of the compartment where it would just hang holding its position in space with the compartment moving all around it before it fell into those miniature waves rolling across the deck, floor to you lubbers, back and forth. It was a spatial relations event. Rock to port, in comes the jet. Rock to starboard, and the space of the compartment would see, seem to catch the suspended water. It was eerie. As the water tumbled into perfect curling waves, those one foot waves would form, roll and crash from port to starboard and back. It was a little cosmos in there. My job was to bail. First a bucket brigade, brigade, brigade and later a dustpan and bucket, throw it over the side. The other guys of the black gang were wiring up the boards that were fitted between the ribs from the bottom up, which would act as forms in which they poured concrete to plug the slot, which was done and it worked. We sailed back to the Long Wharf with a load of crude from Alaska. I love big weather to this day. Now my father had worked heavy construction, building bridges, dams and the like. He had told me about the tensile strength of steel the compression strength of concrete, and how the pull of steel against the push of the concrete magnified their strength. Well, this seemed like the opposite. The steel was not connected to itself. The concrete was just sitting like a plug. So when the inspector took off, took a look and said, called it good, I figured it would be an excellent time to go to college. Thank you.
There we are. Thank you, David. That was a great story. A little bit harrowing. <laughs> well, yeah, I can only, I can't even imagine, but this description was great. I, uh, I was out there with you, wishing I weren't. So thanks a lot to David Bean. And uh, next we're going to have Emily Springer from Homer, Alaska, who uh, I see is going to be reading from her house. We thought she might be aboard the boat that's out in the yard. Sounded to me a little cold. Uh, but she's going to read to us from uh, a historical document from uh, the old days. So here you go, Emily. And you might want to describe yourself and something about your fishery, just a little something to give us some flavor of who, who you are and where you come from. Thanks. Okay. I can't tell if I'm on. We can hear you. Okay, cool. Um, I didn't expect to be doing a little introduction. Um, well, I live in Homer, Alaska. I've been here most of my life and have fished in various places around the state, Southeast and Prince William Sound and Cook Inlet, um, a little bit out in Bristol Bay. But now I'm mostly in Homer. I do mostly historical fish writing these days. And that's what this piece is, is from. It's from a radio story originally. Uh, also based in Homer, Slew Tales. This began as a radio piece and needed some context for Homer, Alaska locals. I'll add a little more here. At our local museum, I reviewed an interview transcript with an old Homer homesteader on July, I reviewed an interview transcript with an old Homer homesteader on July 22, 1981. The interview was conducted by a middle school student. There are very few questions from the student. It's mostly personal commentary, but the interviewer's pulse needs recognition. The young person's present is what brought out the recording, even though the homesteader, Shelford's words are the story and manuscript. It's especially important at the end when Shelford digresses from a satisfying smugness into a tragic wordy memory. To share it, I left some parts of the transcript as direct quotes because they maintain the idiosyncrasies of the speaker. The message I interpret from it is Beluga Slough Chronicle, a central landscape feature to Homer. First, a representation I found in monologue that is not my own. This is Tom Shelford, 1981, from the Pratt Museum archives. I came to Homer to stay in Homer. I lived for two years in Soldovia and came to Homer in 1930. When I first moved to Alaska, I didn't know Soldovia was on the map. I spent a year and a half down in Washington to get enough money to pay my fare. I was planning to go to Fairbanks, but so was everyone else. A fellow on the boat says, you better come to Soldovia with me. And I said, where in the heck is Soldovia? He pointed it out to me on the map. I came up on that old steamer, the Northwestern. We landed in Seward, then took the train to Anchorage. We had to lay in Anchorage for two weeks before we could catch the mail boat down the inlet to Soldovia. I looked at that town and thought, boy, this is the end of the world. Anyway, I only had $20 left in my pocket. I thought I better get some money from someplace and go back. I was walking down the street and old man Young who owns the grocery store was sitting out there on the railing, feeding the pigeons. I got talking to him and asked him if there was any work around here. He said, here comes a fellow down the street right now. I think he's looking for some men. It was Andy Holmes. He had a herring saltery. Young stopped him and introduced me. I asked him if he needed any help. Come right on down, $6 a day, he said. After several more details of float planes and hunting and fishing boats that he once owned, Shelton closes, and I've been here ever since. I homesteaded here, down here on Beluga Slough. I owned half of that slough at one time, bought it for $50. I could talk and talk all day. It used to be quite a deal here when we didn't have any boat harbor, only just this Beluga Slough. He almost closes. The transcript gets very convoluted here. Originally, I skimmed over it and recognized the earlier particulars of personal story. But the story isn't over. It's actually where the pace picks up and the nature of the slew takes over. Here's the weight of it. In the final two pages of transcript, with the self-prompting, with the self-prompt of the slew as a difficult harbor, 
Shelford begins an account of Saldovia residents who insisted on a shuttle to Homer when the water and the weather was bad. The travel date may be inaccurate, but it sounds like spring. It's more a slew of words in a different way than the rest of the piece. It's a marsh of storm terms. It was blowing southwest to beat heck, 12 to 13 foot rolling seas. It was boiling in there. Character names, relationships, interpretations, remember dialogue. I wonder if the mail will be in today, one woman said, and someone else responded, well, they can't use the slough. They'll have to go around the spit and come in Mud Bay. Shelford recalls a group of residents watching the attempted harbor. A final tragic wave fails the engine of the boat that did pursue the slough and was pulled back out into the surf and collapsed. Shelford provides more dramatic and extremely detailed information about who was in the boat, what the folks on the beach did to try and save or find survivors and what they saw the next day. They got right in the mouth of the slough and one of them big seas went over and killed their engine. And then another big one come along, turned the boat clear over and sunk it. In my radio story, public but not Fisher poets, I left some of those details out. I'm still not identifying the characters directly, but we'll say that Shelford watched the attempted harbor with a man whose family, his wife, a baby, and a very young girl were on board the boat. Shelford and the frantic man immediately beat it down there to the beach, but we couldn't do a thing. There was only one skiff there and it was half full of mud. Finally, the two men found a usable skiff and each took an oar and tried to reach the boat. We pretty much got washed up on the bank with the skiff. We watched the boat in the bow, never went down. There was an air pocket up there. It turns out the little girl was rescued from the bow when the boat went dry. The baby was never found and the searchers found the mother's body tossed with driftwood, washed miles down the Homer spit the next day. When he gets a chance, the interviewer ends the story very abruptly with, thank you very much, sir. I will have to come back and talk to you some other time. And then it's complete silence and blank page. Thank you everyone for letting me read from home. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. Great story. I have lived on that spit one entire summer, fishing out of a skiff. And uh, that was long before there was any there was any infrastructure there. It was pretty heavy duty for those people. Um, so thanks for showing up and reading to us from up north. Our next uh, our next performer comes from Camden, Maine, a place that's familiar to me, and uh, he's uh, some somewhat of a wood carver. Um, he does some very nice wood carvings, and in fact, I believe he's out in his wood shop now. Uh, oh, and did I mention he's also a folk singer and a folklorist? Um, I just went out to the hen house, and all the hens out there were calling his name. Please welcome Gordon Bach. <laughs> Thanks, Gordon, for coming. Good to Thank see you. Uh, I've got a song here that I, I made many years ago to. Uh, I was thinking in gratitude of the all the people that took the time to try to teach me enough to stay alive out on the water and uh, manage that. But it ended up the song is also in gratitude for all those people who make it worth staying alive. Didn't know where that boat was going. All I wanted was away from here, and all I knew was to keep on rowing. The first boat I put out to sea, I wouldn't have none to sail with me, none to row and none to tow, and none to stow my cargo. Taken through the storm and all my leading lights were gone. Those three old sailors by my helm 
tell me I don't stay alone. One name Peter, one name Saul, one don't claim no name at all. One to sing and one to fall, one to hear. Stumbled on the reef, I had three good sailors take my grief. One to sail and one to bail and one to hold me when I will. And when I turn for making land, I got three good sailors to my hand. <clears throat> one to stay. And one to lay this anchor down. And if I hoist my sail again, come in sun or go in rain, all the sailors in the sea come hand and haul and steer with me. One to row and one to tow. And one to ease me when I go, one to row and one to tow, and one to heal me when I go. Thank you. Good to see you people again. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks for coming. We really appreciate it. I know it's late back there. We sure miss you guys, and uh, we're looking forward to getting back together again. So uh, sure enjoyed hearing you. And uh, next up, we've got another good friend of mine from that part of the world, Jack Merrill, who uh, is coming from Northeast Harbor, Maine. Actually, it's uh, a little closer to Southwest Harbor, Maine, but right in between the two on Mount Desert Island. Jack, I think, has fished 50 years off Little Cranberry Island because I think he and I started the same year, about 1970, so that's a half a century and uh, still at it. So, yeah, we're uh, bros from the pretty much the cradle on, so good to see you, Jack. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yep, we can nope. hear you. Go ahead. You got me? All right, good. Um, yeah, I hope it hasn't been 50 years, but I guess it has. Uh, well, first of all, to Gordon, as uh, Ashley Bryan would say, you still got it. Um, I want to thank everyone. I wish we could be together, obviously, like everybody, hopefully next year. Um, I'm going to read a few poems. The first one, not to be confused with coffee at Walmart, which I believe is still on the National Fisherman's website. And thanks to Pat Dixon for setting those hooks. So this is called Working at Walmart. We drove down to the shore. The weather had finally broken. Let's get the oil gear working. But the docks were padlocked shut. No fishing, said the sign. Damn, I said. It's okay, my friend said. The council must have approved it. We're not fishermen anymore. We're working for dynamic management. Does it pay the bills, I ask? Does it fulfill my soul, I want to ask? They're willing to retrain us, my friend said. We can get desk jobs, computer training. I'd rather take spray in the face, I said. You remember the, tra the last trip, he said? The big boats had it all sewed up just after we made our first set. We caught some beautiful fish, I said. Yeah, we caught some left-handed fish, but they'd only pay for the right-handed ones, he said. Look, there's nothing we can do, he said. The council has decided. I know there's a ton of fish out there, I said. Yeah, but not for us, for us to catch, he said. No, the council made sure of that, I said. Come on, let's go get some coffee, my friend said. Maybe, I said, but they've shut down the fisherman's net. 
Yeah, I know, my friend said, but there's a new super Walmart right near here. This next poem is called The Mooring. The Mooring. At the end of the day, in the darkness of the harbor, edging forward along the starboard rail, each step a challenge, cold concentration, heavy arms lift the chains over the bow bit. The frozen air holds a man hostage, but we're almost home. The body moves forward on its own, pulled into the skiff by a gentle swell. Careful now, find those oars with frozen fingers, painfully grip and pull, straighten, steady, point the bow towards the docks, as if the tide had a hold of you, slowly ebbing towards a warm home, food never tasting better, sleep a dream away, rowing home with a cold, clean soul. This next poem is called Winter's Over. Winter took off its white robe and quietly melted into ravenous puddles. The black crows eagerly hopped on patches of bare ground. The fishing boats revved their long sleeping engines. The dip nets stirred up rancid bait ready to set out traps. The skiffs huddled together behind the float, tugging on their bow lines. Anticipation starts moving again. The trudge becomes a trot. Bones loosen up. Everything seems to flow downhill towards the docks. From the wood stove to the harbor, as if a door had opened, a child was born, and a song sings spring. Outward Bound. We get up early in the morning, for the afternoon, they gave gale warnings. It's okay, it's a life we're born in, on the ocean we've been sworn into. A life of dreams, money-making schemes, reality just a paycheck away, always a paycheck away. Just a leaky hatch, a wet wooden match, a shaft that's worn, a net that's torn, oil on the deck, hydraulic line, which hose this time? You can bet, as we ready our next set, the Coast Guard's boarding for inspection. My middle finger's getting an erection. No, I respect what they do, though I'm not sure about the crew. We just spent a week ashore. Weather's coming, time to fish is running short. Soon we'll have to beat for port. A trip aboarded would leave us poor. I can't help but think this is no way to win the war. But our spirits fill when they've left us alone till the wind comes up and we're drenched to the bone. The hole holds only half full. We wash down, having pulled our last pull, and turn the wheel towards drier ground. Though in our hearts, we knew if the compass was true, home would find us outward bound. Last Cowboys. Lobstermen litter the ocean with traps, crazy men. They still think they can be independent owners and operators on open water, primitive trapping. A dominant gull on the bow of one vessel, gallant, majestic, with danger in his bright eyes, his stark beak, his awareness, crazy as the spray flies cold on the judgmental sea. The lobsterman lets him strut up front, leading the way as the swell lets his boat ride its back for today at least, but tomorrow might be his last ride. And I'll just finish up with a poem called Finishing Up. Fall declares itself in that bitter hurried wind, in that dying light. Fall blusters its angry muscled cry. History sings through screaming Davy blocks, baiting traps as father did trying to catch tomorrow, the fish boats turn their circles. Thank you very much. I uh, hope to see you in person, all of you, next year. Thank you to you, Jack, and uh, we hope also to see you uh, in the person. And uh, stay warm. I know it's late at night back there, but uh, sure, appreciate you showing up. Love hearing your poetry. So uh, the next person we have is, comes to you from Long Beach, Washington. Uh, we're uh, happy to, 
welcome Patty Harden. And let's let's hear from Patty. You can tell us a little bit about uh, your fishing background. And so I'll let it. I'll just uh, turn it right over to you here. Go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? We we can. Oh. Thank you, Jay. Can you hear me, or should I turn? A little bit chopped up. We can. Yeah, we're yeah. Uh, we're you still can't... waiting. Yeah, keep keep talking. We'll try and see if we can get you through here. Uh, I don't hear you, Patty. So I think we're going to have to um, try working on your your signal there. Okay. Okay. There are. Okay. So, um, so, so what we'll do now is uh, we'll have uh, we'll work on Patty's uh, signal, and we're going to work to get that corrected. In the meantime, I'd like to introduce Tracy uh, Luther, who is uh, grew up fishing. Uh, he's out of Bellingham, Washington. Grew up fishing with his dad on uh, on their gill netter out of Petersburg. You can just sit there, I guess. Whatever. And uh, he's a musician, as as is his dad, a second <laughs> second you. generation fisherman and musician, and. Uh, Understand that uh, you guys uh, catch and bleed your fish, your salmon gill netters. You catch and bleed your fish on board and deliver them to Petersburg, where they're processed and sent down to uh, the lower 48. So, uh, why don't you take it away there, Tristy? Thanks for coming. Thank you so much. Mm. This song is called Alaska. My father is a fisherman. His father was before him. Yeah, I suppose fishing's as old as anything. And I was raised on the water And in the wood by the water's edge From the Salish Sea to Alaska From the 90s through the 10s For my RV sailed on the Salish Before the fishing became thin when my father was forced to travel north to Alaska and I was a child in the womb of the storm and in the anchorage safe from the wild winds in the lap of the waves and the engine at dawn and the folk songs of Dylan from the captain's seat Yeah, I was brought up in the salt and the blood As a warm-blooded killer to harvest with love From the fathoms below to the rains from above In the long summer's path of the northern sun We journey south for the winter and when the summer turns round again like a bird on her course we travel north to Alaska Alaska Love. 
father is a musician his father was before him yeah i suppose music says old is anything and i was seized by the fires of song and a spirit that burns to create and in the spacious seas of Alaska, I met the sacred and found peace. Now all of the wilds are in danger. We're praying the rains may fall again. For with the world in her state, I burn for the fate. Of Alaska, Alaska, I cry with the might of my soul to the height of your mountains, to the depths of your hold. May your treasures be safe and your glaciers be strong, and may all beings flourish by your grace. Alaska, I cry with the might of my soul To the height of your mountains, to the depths of your hold May your treasures be safe and your people stand strong And may all beings flourish by your grace Alaska, I cry with the might of my soul To the height of your mountains to the depths of your hold May your treasures be safe And your salmon run strong And may all beings flourish By your grace And may all beings flourish By your grace Alaska Alaska Tracy, that was great. Thank you so much. And uh, if you guys are up for it, you could just segue right into your dad or we can cut away and come back to you in about whenever you want. We can segue right now. Okay. So next up, uh, believe it or not, we've got uh, Bob Goodmanson, who's going to uh, follow his son. And uh, so you get two for one on this deal. Um, I guess, Bob, that was a a pretty nice tribute to you, I'd say, from that lad. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Pretty good singer he is, too. So uh, Wonderful. Yep. Well, good. So, Bob, is uh, I pretty much described your deal um, as well as your son's. Uh, you want to add anything to it, that would be great. Otherwise, take it away. Uh, no, no, that's, that's about it. We catch fish and process it and then sell it ourselves. <laughs> in Bellingham, fish in southeast Alaska, out of Petersburg, where we have a little process plant <coughs> um, made out of a container. And that's where we do our <coughs> processing. Uh, we're going to do one song, and I'm going to have Tracy sing with me and play. It's, um, it's a song I wrote several years ago, and it's... Um, it's for all the fishermen that have lost their life at sea. <clears throat> it's called, We'll Always Remember You. When the lights are shining bright in the little harbor town, after that long, long run from the fishing grounds You think about taking that walk Cause you tie up the last cleat Cause you know how it feels good Just walking with solid ground under your feet 
That's the time when we remember you Our old friends from the days of old and new Taken by the sea before their time was through We'll always remember you When you're BSing at the dock and there's work to be done You want to hear the end of that story before you gotta run Even though you've heard it once or twice before It's a pretty good one so you like to hear it once more That's the time when we remember you Our old friends from the days of old and new Taken by the sea before their time was through We'll always remember you Sunlight sparkles a spray on that raging sea And you're thinking that there's no place that you'd rather be Cause it won't be long till your anchor's down in that little cove And you'd be watching those tree branches swaying Sitting beside that old oil stove That's the time when we remember you Our old friends from the days of old and new Taken by the sea before their time was through We'll always remember you We'll always remember you Our old friends from the days of old and new Taken by the sea before their time was through We'll always remember you We'll always remember you We'll always remember you We'll always remember you <laughs> That's it. That's all we got. Well, thanks guys. That was really nice. We uh Sure appreciate your both showing up. Glad we had room for you. Thank you. And, yeah, well, uh, thank you. Yeah, sounded good. Um, so hopefully we'll see you back in person sometime. Uh, at this point, I would like to uh, just interject that uh, before we go on to Abigail, who's coming up next, I just heard this week that 400,000 sailors are stranded on ships worldwide can't get off their ships, don't have passports, running out of food. And uh, because of the pandemic and other reasons, mostly the, the virus, but uh, the shutdown of a lot of countries, these folks are stuck. So I want us to remember them. Also, let's not forget those lost at sea. Our hearts go out to them and their families. Next up is Abigail Calkin from Gustavus, Alaska, who 
has written a fine book, uh, or several, I guess, but uh, one of my favorites, uh, The Night Orion Fell. So welcome, Abigail. Thanks for coming. Okay. Well, good evening. And uh, you're here, and I'm here, and that's the best we're going to get this year. So uh, I have three poems. And, but before I read them, I also would like to thank uh, Jay and John and everyone else who has put this together, Amanda leading the remoteness of it. And uh, for all the moving work that I've heard this week, it's been pretty remarkable. I'm going to read you three poems. <clears throat> um, golly, my... There it is. Okay. First one, The Little Prince Underwater. I swim without a school, less likely to be netted by a knowledgeable or aberrant fisherman. I enjoy freedom of this or that mild current, for I can swim which way I want. I dive beneath gannets and whales, once deep I cozy in a crevice of gnarled rock. When shallow, I hide among kelp. I make certain I do not hide in a rock-like fish mouth. I swim the edge of schools, yet remain isolated, for I am a lone grouper. Fata Morgana. As I went through the strait to sea, Fata Morgana appeared between distant mountains and shoreward waves to shiver the air, fishing beyond sight on the broad blue, land rose where there was none, and buildings crept along that vacant shimmered shore. Fata Morgana, the fairy of deception, sent a jeweled mantle, a gift for Arthur. The maid who brought it said, never wear the mantle. And cloaking herself in it, she fell dead, disintegrating into ashes. Fate had told her such. Stand at the Strait of Messina between Sicily and Calab Calabria. See the illusion of Fata Morgana a mirage that magnifies vertically all buildings and trees, lures all but the most iron of people to doom at sea. An island lies here, an island does not lie there. Returning along the beaches of Chichikov Island, see the illusion painted in Northern Winter's glow where mountains double in size, leap bays of glaciers, Watch the sun at December's full height, 10 degrees above the southern horizon. Feel the layers of cold as you watch light play with masses of dense and denser air. Watch my ship leave the waters to sail on air. Look, Fata Morgana disappears from illusion to thermal inversion where warm air lies atop cold, where plastics and polyfloral alkyl seep into our bodies as we lie in an illusory net and slip into the ashes we wear on our fingertips when we grapple in rivers and oceans cloaked with foam, earth, debris. One more. Out to his home at sea. F.B. Karen still lives in the Van de Couvering family in the town of Garibaldi. She moves across the ocean, fishing for prawns, pink shrimp, tuna, or crab. People told Cody he was crazy to leave a good job on another's boat, buy this old one, go out on his own. But he's a Van de Couvering from three generations of Garibaldi fishermen. He said, no, I go on my own. It's a 58 foot wooden dragger. Why go with wood? Local fishermen asked. 
Why not? For Cody, it was family history, a long, proud tradition of boats, good hands mixed, sorry, good hauls mixed with tragedies of poor catches, no money, and too many deaths. No Van de Couvering came from a family of do it the usual way, have a secure job on another's boat. As, the Van, as a Van de Couvering moves out of his home at sea, he hears a noise where no one is. Yes, that noise from any fishing town that says, I taught you the lines, now I back you up. Unbolt your gear, fix your coffee. I whisper in your ear to steer you straight across the bar ahead. I'm here behind you, on the deck. I, your Garibaldi guardian. Thank you. Thanks, Abigail. Thank I was you. honored to have met uh, Van de Couverings, um, David. Sadly, he's not with us any longer. But um, moving on along, we have Kathy Stack, who is from Salt Spring Island, British Columbia, but I believe is in California. And uh, a fine singer, songwriter. Uh, we've always enjoyed having her here. And uh, so welcome back, Kathy. Thank you, you, Jay. Thank you, Jay. Um, I, I worked on a um, fish packer for over 30 years. All, we traveled all over the coast of British Columbia and up into Southeast Alaska. We collected um, salmon and herring. And one of the fellows we collected um, salmon from was uh, Long John Seacord from Cortez Island, British Columbia. And uh, he had a boat called the Silver Trident, which was uh, whenever he'd deliver, he'd, he'd uh, have more fish than anybody, anybody else. And when it came time to party, he partied longer and harder than anyone else. This is for him and the six other men and women that lost their lives in the hurricane force storm off of Vancouver Island in 1984. It was a leftover from, from a typhoon and uh, they weren't expecting, the weathermen weren't expecting it at all, so. Chum on the western shore. Vancouver Island winds get tricky that time of year. The weatherman said, just a game. Don't you fear? Tony was a hard living, hard loving, hard fishing man. Tony was a hard drinking, hard driving, hard fishing man. Nick Cape Cook when it started to blow with the water in the air a hundred feet or more wind screamed in the rigging like a banshee on the moor the seas were crazy mountains the wind became a roar Tony was a hard living hard loving Hard fishing man, Tony was a hard drinking, hard driving, hard fishing man. You think a man would curse his 
fate when he knew that he would drown. He calmly keep a microphone. The boys were going down. Johnny was a hard living, hard loving, hard fishing man. Johnny was a hard drinking, hard driving, hard fishing man. Silver tried it in pieces on the shore. We shed a tear for John and crew out on the ocean floor. Coast wide friends gathered for an all night party. We sent him all the way he lived, so wild and free. Johnny was a hard living, hard loving. Man. Johnny was a hard drinking, hard driving, hard fishing man. Gonna miss you, John. Thank you, Jay, and thank you, Amanda, and and John Broderick, and see you in person next year. I'm hoping. Thank you. Start your video, so start that. Thanks, Kathy. Great to see you again and uh, hear your sad song. That That's uh, one of my favorites and a sad, sad thing it was indeed. Wilfred Wilson comes to us tonight. Wilfred from Delta, BC. Uh, been with us a few years now, Wilfred. Great to see you back. And... Uh, I'll just turn it right over to you now, so let her go. Okay, hi there. I, uh, I've i been uh, 60 years commercial fishing now, 50 years as my own boat owner. Um, I, I host a, a poet gig, Rivers End poet gig in uh, Steveston. We were canceled last year. Um, it's usually at the Gulf of Georgia National Museum. And uh, I just wanted to say uh, hi to Ron there. I like the chops, Ron. And uh, Richard, the fauna was intriguing. Um, this story I'm going to tell is uh, I was told of it over 40 years ago. And uh, I call it In Silence. <clears throat> the time is now for the next move up along the coast. Herring fishing is done in the south. In March, the winds can be very unforgivable. When it was thought the whole fleet be stormbound, unknown was a family-owned boat, got the jump with a few others and was away. With five family, family members on board and one dear friend, When an explosion started uh, the dreaded engine room fire, abandoned the very object uh, counted on to get you through. In the hastened moments that goes by in the blink of an eye, when only a single survival suit was grasped, for all to get into the life raft is no small, no small miracle in seas so very, very rough. The life raft rolling over more than once. With one on the outside, walking as one to write it once again. Where it became evident, the water all bailed out each time a foot deep had to be left for ballast. Taking turns with suit an hour at a time to warm, only to be given up to one whose back was injured as advanced hypothermia sets in. When seas finally calmed down enough to bail out one final time, lay six on top of each other 
in a pyramid in rotation is what had to be done to help conserve what little energy is left in their soaked bodies with the injured one always in the middle. Canada had just invested in the long range Aurora plane. Day one debris. Day two long range pushed to the limit. When all the training goes out the window, for how were they to know in an ocean so full? Their very drift was altered so dramatically by a mere foot of water. Their search is done in grids as far north as they were to go when something had a spotter glance back. Unbeknown to them, the first five of six flares did not work. The six spotted and reported, I think I see something back there. Told to me when the wings were wobbled as they flew over, more than one tear fell from those dehydrated souls. More than three days were to pass, just at daylight on the 4th, when I'm on the wheel in solitude, contemplating a mariner's place upon the world. Over the radio, word of survival, as time was taken to, time was taken to tell immediate family first. Waking uncle to share, he states, don't, don't bullshit me. No, no, it's, it, it's true. Together in silence, waiting in wheelhouse, what seems an eternity. They've been found all alive. The joy is immense, pure, pure. For he was to state the unspoken words. I'll be damned. I'd started to give up the boys, as had I, as had I. And, uh, the ironic part of that, there is a, that friend of mine that told me this story 40 years to the day, within a few minutes of that time when they were rescued, he was medevaced out again by helicopter on the fishing grounds with a medical emergency. And he's, he's okay. He's, uh, he's, uh, he's living a, a bit of a charmed life, shall I say. And uh, I look forward to, to sitting with him again one day. Thank you. And uh, it's good to see everybody. And I want to thank everybody for their efforts. Uh, it's a pleasure and uh, it's good to be here in this forum and uh, I look forward to next year to, to see everybody in person. Goodbye. Thanks, Wilfred. Uh, pretty harrowing tale. And uh, of course we wanna remember all those lost at sea that didn't make it back uh, and their families as well. I think all of us pretty much have known others that didn't that weren't so fortunate. So Alec McMurrin is coming up next. Uh, Alec is in Petersburg, Alaska, and uh, sure good to have you back, Alec. Um, we're pretty good on time, we're running right along here, so I'm going to turn it over to you at this point. Oh, thanks a lot, Jay. Um, <laughs> wow, that was a lot of heroism. Uh, <laughs> what a great story. Um, all right, well, I'll sing a song. And there's, there's some heroics in this too. And, and also a happy ending too. Like, <laughs> Nobody wanted 
dad's old fish boat just fell into my hands one day. A brother, he was out, sobered up. My father had just passed away. They worked like mad to save the old wood slab. There it was up in the old boat yard. She wasn't ready, we took a fishing. I put expenses on the old bank card. Got ballast at the city I shoe and headed up the inside coast. Climbed the ladder to the top house station. At the wheel stood daddy's ghost. He told me, West, just outside of Sitka, the halibut fishing, it's a mighty fine. If you get your dead ass a moving son, well, you might just get there just in time. Ready or not, boys, here she goes. Man, that boat it was all messed up. Galley was a Coleman stove. Breakfast came in a coffee cup. Just got brother out of rehab. Just got daddy in the ground. Got to Sitka just in time. Bet it all on this go round. Headed up the inside passage with a plan, gonna make it pay. Running steady with the big spring tide, stack on fire the whole damn way. And needed coffee, stopped in Sitka, always ready, more or less. Scattered tubs of salted salmon, bags and flags, a righteous mess. My brother and a friend of his was out back baiting gear. I jury rigged the deck controls and let go from the ancient pier. Time was short, we just kept it moving all the way to the fishing ground. We needed strength, speed, and courage because we bet it all on this go round. Ready or not, boys, here she goes. And that boat it was all messed up. The galley was a Coleman stove. Breakfast came in a coffee cup. It just got brother out of rehab. It just got daddy in the ground. Got to sit good just in time. Bet it all on this go round. Set out all our worn out gear, had a breakfast while we let it soak. Ran back on a glassy swell, hauled the end up to the boat. On every hook, there was a soaker. On a couple, there were two or three. Never seen nobody work so hard, my brother and his friend and me. Just that one day, we filled the boat with 30,000 pounds. The weather held, price it doubled as it motored from the grounds. We settled up and headed home. Now there's talk around that Sitka town about the boat that was just in time. I bet it all on this go round. Ready or not, boy, here she go. Man, that boat, it was all messed up. The galley was a Coleman stove. Breakfast came in a coffee cup. Just got brother out of rehab. Just got daddy in the ground. Got to sit good just in time. Let it all on this go round. It can happen to you. Thanks, Alec. Great song. Love that rhythm, boy. Thank you, you so very much. Yeah, we ought to sit down and jam sometime. So uh, thank you, Alec. And um, moving along, we've got a, another fisherman uh, right here in the local area, South Bay Rob. <laughs> This is Rob Seitz coming to you from, uh, I assume, from Astoria or are you across the river. I don't know, but uh, oh, Astoria. All right. Well, welcome. Can you hear me? Okay. 
Yeah, I hear you fine. Yeah, Rob, sorry I didn't make it up to the boat yard. I know you're hauled out and you offered me a chance to roll around there in the bill. Oh, yeah. I hope it's going well. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, we'll be there for a while, so there's still plenty of time. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. <laughs> All right, well, take it away, Ben. Okay, thanks a lot. I uh, want to say thanks to everyone, Amanda, John, Jay, Jamie, and all the other people that I don't know. Or uh, Anyway, uh, I'll get going right away. I want to set everyone's mind at ease. I don't know what Pat's been saying, but uh, I won't be doing my Jeffrey Tubin impersonation tonight, so you can keep the video on. Anyway, uh, my, fir or my first poem, uh, there's three words I say with some regularity. So to show my appreciation, I wrote them a poem. And uh, by the way, the first time I did this, I tied for last with Measy. So I figure uh, on the uh, poetry slam, so I figure that just means it's a measy caliber poem. Anyway, I call it Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. When your desired course of action requires that you don't give it too much thought, jump in with both feet, my friends. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. <laughs> When your new deckhand shows for boat call and he's drunker than snot, hand him his walking papers, but ask, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. When thanks to a crab pot stainless wire jagger, your brand new bibs are already shot. Get out that patching material and stick it with a whiskey tango foxtrot. <clears throat> when your way out of your league city girlfriend starts hinting around about tying the knot, well, this, this is one of those situations I recommend phrasing it a little differently if you're thinking whiskey tango foxtrot. When you keep zigging when you should have been zagging, water hauling when everybody else caught, you can plead your case to the fish gods with a whiskey tango foxtrot. Okay, you guys getting tired of this yet? Okay, uh, now I don't know if I'm my age. Ought to be writing poems like this or not. But it's better than storming the Capitol. So, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. Okay. I don't know if I have any time left, but I'll hurry. I'll say one thing I like about the pandemic is that uh, I like being called an essential worker. I hope that keeps up after it's all over, you know. People are still going to need to eat after the after the virus is gone. Anyway, I've been trying to talk Tiffin to call me an essential husband, but she says there is no such thing. Okay, so uh, anyway, uh, let me. Uh, I want to do one more quickie if you don't mind, because I think you can get through just about anything if you just put your head down and work. I call this work ethic. When you find yourself in the middle of a bad luck streak and all the evidence suggests that you're about as charismatic as a fart in an elevator and you're feeling that lost skin sting from a busted knuckle lack of finesse, it's comforting to know you can always fall back on a good work ethic. Thanks a lot. Nice seeing everyone. Good job.
Classic Rob. Well, thanks a lot there, buddy. Uh, good to see a picture of you anyway. I haven't seen your face for a while now. So anyway, yeah, this has been good. Um, I'll take a chance right now and uh, thank all of the Fisher Poets that have shown up for this. It's been great. And to keep the fire going. We'll keep that fire going until next year, hopefully. Yep, yeah, uh, for all the hard work. And uh, so far, it's definitely been worth it. So uh, at this point, we're... Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to bring try and bring Patty back, uh, if that's a, an opportunity there or not. But um, if you want to try it, we can. Otherwise, I think uh, we should just move right on. I do want to thank John Broderick, who is my good buddy and uh, partner, uh, for backing me up on this one and uh, also for inviting me to play a little music on his set the other night. Um, I also want to thank all you fans out there for watching and keeping this, uh, giving us the encouragement to, to do this. It's been a bit of a steep cliff to climb for all of us here. Anyway, I moved into my uh, little music room here because I thought, well, since we're all virtual and up close and virtual, I thought I'd do a little music piece tonight. Uh, this, this, this one here I wrote just before last year's Fisher Poets Gathering, February 15th, 2020, and it's called Big Water, so I'll do it right here. Big water will make you humble. It'll cut you down to size. Big water tried to take my life. Thank the stars, I did survive. First time I saw big water. 300 miles from shore. It was breezing up something wicked As we ran before the storm Well, the seas, they looked like mountains We were scared, that you can be sure Wind was screaming in the rigging Like a banshee on the moor in her grip Then she let us slip away Was it providence Just a twist of fate To live another day Big water Will make you humble It'll cut you down to size Big water Tried to take my life Thank the stars that I did survive. Well, I rode the cold in late December. The sky was buckshot gray. 
rights were smoking, I can still remember they were rolling like a southbound freight. Well, it took me, took me down to the bottom. My board came after me. Rip cage shattered and broken as I glimpsed eternity. Well, the doctor called for morphine. Two vials into my veins. Thank you, Sister Morphine. I don't care to go that way again. Well, big water will make you humble. It'll cut you down to size. Big water tries take my life, thank the stars I did survive. Thank the stars I did survive. So that's that. I see that we have Josh Wineski, and uh, I think does Josh want to come come on for a quick one? I see his face there. Um, he appeared on my screen. Where do we stand, folks? I think we're right at the end of the set. So we're gonna head to intermission here. All right, well, you know what? We're uh, amazing we were right on time. It was unfortunate we couldn't have Patty, but uh, I wanna thank you all again for showing up and for giving us your attention and your good feelings. And we'll take an intermission of a half an hour and then come back with the last set of the of the gathering. Uh, thanks for sticking with us and for all your support and encouragement. It's been great. And thanks to uh, Amanda for making this all happen and the pit crew behind her. We're very encouraged. So good night, folks. We'll see you back in a half an hour. All right, and we are back. Okay, hello everybody. I'm Holly Hughes and I'm honored to be the MC for the final set. So welcome to the closing set for Fisher Poets Gathering 2021, the Zoom edition. As Jay said, we've had to go virtual this year, but we're hoping to be personal next year. Under normal circumstances, Fisher Poets attracts nearly 100 poets, songwriters, and storytellers from both coasts, including Alaska and Hawaii, and, and often as far away as England. In fact, we have a performer from England tonight, thanks to Zoom. A celebration of the commercial fish, fishing industry in poetry, prose, and song, the Fisher Poets Gathering has been happening the last weekend in February since 1998. I've been lucky enough to be a participant every year since that first year when a handful of us gathered at the Wet Dog. Since then, it's grown by leaps and bounds, and it's a testament to the commitment and resiliency of the Fisher Poet crew that this is happening this year especially. So some people to thank, thanks to the efforts of, of John Broderick, Jay Speakerman, and all those behind the screens Amanda and her Able Sea Grant crew. Thank you also to my trusty backup MC, Doug Rhodes, who will be performing tonight and has been right there supporting me and the performers all along. I'd also like to thank some of our sponsors. Um, we've got a great lineup. Actually, the sponsors. 
Here we go. Sponsors are Oregon Sea Grant, the Telecom Foundation, KMUN, City of Astoria, Hip Fish Monthly, um, Jonathan White, Michelle Abramson, Patricia Freeland, Clatsop Community College, Oregon Folklife Network, Astoria Warrington Cham Chamber of Commerce. And um, I'll maybe mention a few more later on. I also wanted just to just acknowledge that normally we're filling these wonderful venues in Astoria and instead we're filling a Zoom screen, which is exciting, but not quite the same. So just a quick shout out to the um, venues that we can't be at this year, but we hope to be back next year. The Astoria Brewing Company, which was formerly the Wet Dog, where, where this whole thing started. The Kala Gallery, the Columbia Theater, the Liberty Theater, the Fort George Lovell Showroom, the Voodoo Room, one of my favorites, the 1015 Theater, the Labor Temple Diner and Bar, Winecraft, Clatsop Community College, Pier 39, and the Cannery Workers Museum, and finally, the Columbia River Maritime Museum. So, um, so let's go ahead and, and get started then. Um, the way this is going to work is I'll call out the name of each performer and where they're from, and then they'll take it from there, telling you a little bit of about their background in fishing and whatever they want to tell you about whatever they're planning to share. Leading us off is Henry Hughes from Monmouth, Oregon, no relation. Um, I do happen to know he's a fine poet. So Henry, let's, let's get started. Take it away. Thanks so much, Holly. It's great to be here. I'm really honored to be with so many fine uh, poets, musicians, and artists. I grew up uh, in Long Island, New York, uh, on Long Island Sound. And uh, in those days, I, I was a deckhand on mostly on charter fishing boats, but I'd pitch in on a dragger or a lobster boat. And so this poem is set back in the 80s when I had just finished high school and I was pitching in with a kind of a tough lobsterman. And uh, this is lobstering. Long Island, 1983. And don't show up drunk, Ziggy warned, but I had one hell of a hangover, waking in my parked car to the window thump of his greasy fist. I was 18. We baited a hundred wooden pots, stacked the deck, and ran that dirty down easter toward Shoreham, the nuclear plant they never finished. When my dad worked for 10 years, Goddamn waste, Ziggy shook his head, and we're going to pay for it. He smoked down cigarettes. I splashed heavy pots. Every time he yelled, drop it friggin' flat, I thought of my girlfriend and getting paid. We'd pick him up in a couple days, no numbers, all in his head, black and white bullet buoys, lying on a davit, seaweed, plastic, spider crabs, snails, and marble brown lobsters pulled from the bedroom. Girls and kids, back over. Rubber bands on the claws of a keeper, some rich guy from Manhattan will buy at the restaurant, wearing his ridiculous bib, cracking a fat claw that squirts his girlfriend's face. Their drunken laughter, sounding like gulls, swooping the last of the rotten fish I cleaned from those pots. I've got one more poem. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of us fisher people talk about superstition. You know, of course, historically it was very important to people who sailed and fished. But I think I think luck still plays into it. We still talk about luck. So this comes out of an experience with an artisanal fishery uh, for bluefin tuna, rod and reel fishery for bluefin off of Maine. And a friend uh, had a good season down there. He's he was basically a deckhand. And the last day. He asked the captain, a very superstitious old guy, if he could bring his girlfriend along. And the captain hesitated a little bit, but then he said, okay, this is luck. Cappy tore apart the shack, searching for his favorite salt-stained tattered hat, barking at us when we stepped over rods or taunted a gull. We'd never pack a banana or rename a boat, even if the boat's name was Misty. Old time was warned of redheads, women, and whistling. And she was all three, boarding left-footed in her green bibs and starfish sweater, conjuring gentle swells and the season's biggest bluefin. 
She fought that fish for three hours till we gaffed, hook flying free and hoisted. Her arms and back relaxed. Her glowing hair fell to dusk. You're a lucky gal, Cappy praised best he could. Watching that huge tuna beat out its last song, she looked wistful and blue like a mermaid farewelling a friend. Thanks so much. Rock on, poets. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Henry. That was that was wonderful. Wow. That second one especially brought back memories for me of watching. It's always hard, um, you know, watching a, a fish die. And um, I also remember the very first time I my first season in Petersburg, it, you know, stepping onto a boat and having a skipper shout at me that get off, get off your bad luck. So I know those superstitions die hard, but I hope that we're making <laughs> some some a few changes since now there's lots more women in the fleet, which is good to see. Um, thank you, and thank you for the the little taste of lobstering and and little. I love learning about fishing on the other coast too. Okay, next up we have Melanie Brown from Juno. So, Melanie, can you say a few words about yourself? We'd love to hear you. Sure. Hi, I'm um, talking to you here um, from Slingat Ani, the um, the lands of the Akwan and Takukwan uh, Slingat people. Um, the lands of my people um, are in Bristol Bay. M my mother was born in Naknek, and that's where I have fished every summer that I fished for over 40 years now. Um, I missed a couple of years uh, because I was pregnant with my two children. And then um, this year I, I didn't go because of the pandemic. I just, there was just too much uncertainty for me. And then when the tribes in um, Bristol Bay asked that people not come in, I felt like that was uh, the deciding factor for me. Um, but I miss it terribly. Um, and I, I'm really looking forward to going back this summer um, as long as another variant doesn't appear. Um, I'm not a greenhorn, but I still feel like one, a Fisher Poets greenhorn that is. Um, my first Fisher Poets was a couple of years ago and I think I would have performed last year, but um, I was in the shop as as John said. <laughs> he said that there were a number of people in the shop last year, and, but um, I had been recovering long enough that um, I decided to make the trip so I could just enjoy being with everybody at Fisher Poets because it's just such a wonderful swirl of energy. Um, and I knew that it would really help me in my healing process. And um, it did. <laughs> it also happened to be um, the last trip that I've taken out of state. Um, so I'm really grateful that I, I did take take the time to, to go. Um, Today I'm going to share something with you that's somewhat of a freestyle, I guess. I have my thoughts all lined out, but somehow it's just really hard for me to create a flow of words um, that I could actually write down and set sort of in stone and read from. But um, hopefully what I share will make some sense. Um, I did entitle it, um, intending to try to write something. And I'm going to set a timer right now because I'm, I, I, I'm going to need a warning to not go over. Um, but the title that I came up with is Sing It Out. Um, so I remember, you know, being a girl, I've, I've, I've spent every summer of my life in Bristol Bay, um, except for, you know, the few that I mentioned. And um, my grandmother gave me my Yupik name, which means somebody who's come from far away. And that's because I had to come all the way from Sitka to, to meet my great grandparents for the first time when I was a month old. And my, um, yeah, my Yupik name is Taikupa. But I remember um, going to mug up at Nel it, when it was called Nelboro Packing Company. For you old timers who, you know, who fished Bristol Bay, you know Nelboro Packing Company. Now it's called Alaska General Seafoods. And I still fish for that camp. But I remember um, my mom 
she, you know, we, we would see um, people at Mug Up who came from up the lake. And it, it's not a derogatory term. It's just, just a description of, pe you know, people who would come down from Iliamna Lake. And, um, you know, because they had um, uh, gotten their, their permits through limited entry, you know, from accumulating enough points through, you know, the gear license system. And so they would come down and um, my parents, um, when we weren't fishing yet, they liked to go to uh, Danny O'Hara's uh, ch church, his chapel. And um, I can remember um, seeing uh, Walter Johnson, um, he'd play his bass while Danny O'Hara played his electric guitar. And I think that was the first time I ever saw live electric guitars play. But there was this man who would sing. His name was Jim Richteroff. And um, my mom explained to me today, I was, I was trying to make sure I remembered his name right, to honor him in the right way. And... Um, uh, she said he cr he crewed for Walter Johnson, but I can remember hearing on the CB radio in our little shack um, uh, the uh, uh, Walter Johnson talking to his um, I think it was his brother-in-law Gus Jensen. They came they would come down from Pedro Bay, and um, they you know I'd always hear Ambassador Hornet. Hornet ambassador, you know, their, their, uh, boat names, you know, calling back and forth, talking all the time and waking us up when we needed to sleep. Um, but Jim Richteroff, when he would sing, I think it was the first time that I ever felt pierced by an amazing voice. I always loved hearing singing and trying to sing along on, you know, to the radio, to pop music, but there was something about Jim's voice that, um, was so penetrating and he had a way of singing out where like just kind of looking back and thinking about it um it's funny how you realize things when you get older thoughts will come to you that um and then and you just you understand them in a new way you know with the the time that you accumulate living um but i guess now i've come to realize that i really think jim was singing out his pain through gospel music and the people that got to witness him singing that out. At the time, I was just a silly girl who just like, I didn't understand. And I didn't understand the feelings that he was projecting, just that I was feeling feelings that I didn't understand. And I, I wanted to laugh because I didn't know what else to do. I just felt so uneasy from these feelings. But now I feel like there's so much more understanding that I bring bring to them. Um, feelings of how much my people have been through. Um, and uh, it, uh, it, you know, this this year, it's been so crazy with the pandemic and how there's such a reverberation, especially with the fact that like, you know, the last pandemic that's really swept through um, Bristol Bay in Western Alaska was a century ago. It seems monumental, the fact that it was a, a century ago. But I think the thing that a lot of people forget is that not very many years before that, there was a major catastrophe that happened, um, a natural disaster with the Katmai eruption. I've already gone over, um, but I just, I, it was hard not going. I missed the tundra. I missed the smell of the tundra. I missed the miniature forest, but staying in, um, Juneau, uh, um, I, I've learned to love the forest. The forest has let me love it. And I feel like it's loved me back and it's gifted me with amazing things with food and medicine. And, um, and recently I made really Melanie? good friends with a uh, cedar tree um, that isn't supposed to be where it is. Um, and have written, I finally become brave enough to write my own songs. And I just, um, I had planned on sharing a little sample of that, but uh, I'm sorry I've run over time. Anyways, um, I'm really happy to, uh, 
to share and be with you in this way. And I'm looking forward to being together with you again next year at Fisher Poets Gathering. Be well, take good care, and um, see you next time. Thank you so much, Melanie. Um, yeah, that was a powerful story. And we can appreciate how difficult a year it's been for everybody, and especially, I think, um, for the tribes in Alaska. So thank you for offering us that important perspective and sharing your thoughts with us too. And, and um, yes, I remember Nell Bro back in the old days in Bristol Bay. So um, thank you for re reminding me of that. And we look forward to hearing more next year, hopefully in person. Um, next up, we have Max Broderick from Cannon Beach. Um, I'll let Max introduce himself. Oh, next up, we have Doug Rhodes, it looks like. Let's see. Amanda, maybe you can help me out. I've got Max Broderick on my list. But happy to go with Doug Rhodes if that's... Indeed. No, you're, you're, you did it right. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> Am I in? Yay, you're in. Go for it. Okay, great. Yeah. Hi, my name is Max Broderick. Um, it was really uh, interesting to hear Melanie's perspective. Um, I'm also a, a Bristol Bay fisherman. Fish up there for about 20 years uh, with my dad, John Broderick. He's been fishing there a lot longer than I have. Uh, we have a family operation up there. And um, I'm just going to jump right into a poem that I wrote uh, kind of about dad, John. Uh, and fishing. I'm going to make sure I don't run out of time here, so I'm just going to get to it. <clears throat> Johnny B's been fishing in Nishigak for 20 or more years and dragged his kids at age 13 to work and sweat and swear. At the time he enlisted me to be his crew at age 13, he'd been working two-man crews. You could use a guy like me. At first, though, I was a pansy, worthless 13-year-old boy. Unlike Johnny, I didn't understand fishing's complications and its joys. 10 hours of picking fish and I'd be tired, cold, scared, and wet. And Johnny just keep picking fish, all that he could get. Sometimes during a particularly cold and windy scratch, Johnny dropped me off at the cabins and then he'd head right back to picking fish and pulling gear until he could hardly stand. And it was during those times he earned the name Iron Man. Johnny enlisted me at 13 as a third man of the crew. Through summer times, we fished and sweat as often fishers do. A night I remember not quite so fondly that first year of mine was one when we'd been working hard and pulling double time. I didn't really realize just what my pop had gotten me into until we were in a blow and the fish were beginning to hit our nets so hard that we couldn't get close to keeping up. And I was so exhausted that I began to throw it up. He grabbed me by my waders and said, son, you buck up. There's a blow, but there's also fish. So we are making bucks. It's why we're here. And that includes you. You're making your college tuition. You're an investment that I've made that's finally coming to fruition. See, Johnny had a reputation for fishing through thick and thin. And it was he whose motto was, we're sticking and staying. Sometimes folks would pull their nets and head in if fishing was bleak but Johnny would just keep rolling gear as if fishing was on a streak. At my tender youthful age and in my naivete, I wish I could join those crews, head home and hit the hay. So sometimes he'd drop me off to a skiff heading home, me feeling a little bashful and also thinking to myself, that guy's a hardworking asshole. Then sometime the next day, he'd come in and take a two hour nap, brew some coffee, grab his gear and worn out baseball cap, pound through the bay to his piece of mud where a buoy marked his sight, set his gear and sift the water all the way through the night. Even now, while we're fishing 20 years later, Johnny will pull a 32 hour shift, get home and pull off his waders. He'll grab his banjo and guitar and head over to Oli's for a night of music, laughter, small and tall stories. Just four years ago, we were in a bind and had to load the boat. As the tide fell quickly, we were trying to keep her afloat. Sweat dripped down my face as I rushed to load our stuff. Looking back, I saw Johnny had two anchors, chain and line, and was trudging through the mud. I'll never forget that day when we were in that pinch, and Johnny had those anchors walking through the mud inch by inch. 
And Johnny just kept moving hell bent on making his way over to the boat so we could head back out across the bay to sift water or lace our pockets. Day by day, you never can tell. But he'll be picking gear and loading nets till ice freezes over hell. Now that time's passed, he's got more than he needs for crew. But if you try to give him a break, that's not what he will do. He'll tell you that he's just fine. Maybe take a quick nap and fall asleep on top of a fish toad as quick as a snap. Then he'll wake up frozen from being so still and get all fired up about all the fish there is to kill. He'll roll through all the nets and tinker with them, going through the motions, just because he woke up from that nap feeling so damn frozen. Johnny knows there's not much tangled in the web of mesh, but he'll work them both just so, nonetheless. He's given Bristol Bay 25 years and he's got 20 more, just like timeless other folks who fish those remote shores. He'll work beyond his time, sifting the muddy sea. He is, after all, Iron Man, Fisherman Johnny B. Thank you. Oh, Max, what a wonderful tribute to your dad. Mm -hmm. That was great. Yeah, you know, I heard you read that last year, and I was sitting right next to your dad, when, and it was so wonderful to watch his response. So... Yeah, I've known your dad a long time, and I can say that sticking and staying, you know, that's that's been his way for a long, long time. We gillnetted together back in Southeast Alaska in the early years before all you kids came on the scene. So it's really wonderful to, to hear you being part of the whole fishing enterprise now and, and writing such a wonderful tribute. Thank you. So next up is my backup MC Doug Rhodes from Craig, Alaska. And this is just a chance to thank Doug again. He's been such a great help. Okay, Doug, take it away. Okay. Uh, am I on there? I'm not, uh, am I on there? Okay. Yeah, thanks, Holly. Uh, my name's Doug Rhodes. I'm a gill netter and a long liner in, uh, out of Craig here and uh, on Prince Wales Island. And I've watched uh, every performer so far this, uh, the last three days. And that's the first time we've ever been able to do that. And I've noticed something in watching all these performers. And the thing I've really noticed is that a lot of us kind of look the same. Uh, I think they call it the graying of the fleet. So it's kind of nice to see some of these young guys that are coming up and, uh, and young guys and gals that are doing the poetry and uh, are the future. And I like that, but it did remind me of a poem I wrote. I wrote it years ago and it's called Old Guys. I remember when I was just a kid and my eyes filled with surprise as I walked the docks and looked at boats and listened to the stories of the old guys. They talked about the good times and they talked about the bad times too, but I just sat there listening because it was all so exciting and new. I learned about thread and herring, splitting tails and twisting hooks, in and abanals at the diamond. You can't read this stuff in books. I heard about surviving tsunamis, how to keep spoons bright with hydrotone, advice on how to make and use a code sheet way back before anyone had a cell phone. And now after almost 50 years of fishing, as I tell you this, I can finally realize that you're listening to every word I say. Crap, I've become one of those old guys. And you know, sometimes you don't know if you're an old guy or not, but uh, I wrote this poem, must have been 12 years ago, and I had to change it to home after almost 40 years. I had to change it to after almost 50 years. So I guess that means you are an old guy. And uh, my, my last poem here, this one has uh, a little, I, I have uh, my, my next performer here, Katrina Peavy, is going to be uh, helping me with this one. And this is a poem called The Lima Flag, and it's a lighter look at a crappy year with the pandemic and everything. But... The Lima flag, uh, Lima is a code uh, flag that represents the letter L in the alphabet. And that letter L just happens to mean quarantine. I don't know why Q couldn't mean quarantine, but apparently L got to mean uh, that it was uh, quarantine. So this one is called Lima flag. This past year has really been nuts. It's one we sure don't wanna repeat. COVID affected just about everything we do, and it really hit our fishing fleet. It seems that all the paperwork that was on my boat, I was constantly rearranging, 
every week we got new state and federal mandates and all of the rules were changing. Now, I'm all about doing my part and I know that all of this helped save lives. So we kept to our island social bubble and we learned about N95s. I even bought one of those fancy forehead thermometers. All of this stuff was becoming a drag. And in case we were exposed to Corona, we had to carry a Lima flag. Now, if you see the Lima flag flying, it should alert your fears. Because according to the International Code Signal book, it hasn't been used in 100 years. Only Alaska and Rhode Island adopted it, and most people don't know what it might mean. It's not that you're actually sick, it's just that your boat's in quarantine. So if you traveled to Alaska from out of state or had an active case of COVID-19, you had to fly your Lima flag for two weeks during your quarantine. One of our gill netters had his daughter fly up from Portland for his crew and old Ralphie flew that Lima flag for everyone in the fleet to view. But after a while, we, flew, we uh, fell into a routine. And just like we had done at the start, we made sure to wear masks while in town and socially distance one fathom apart. Now, both my crew and I were locals. So this quarantine stuff seemed like a gag. I wasn't sure what it would take to have to fly that Lima flag. But looking back, I'm getting a little worried and on my conscience, it's starting to nag. Uh, I screwed up, didn't I? I helped a friend out with his hydraulics, and when they started to work, he let out a cheer. And just like always, when I came down to the boat, Brian had repaid me for some help with some beer. But looking back, I'm getting a little worried, and on my conscience, it's starting to nag, because he gave me a case of Corona. <laughs> so was I supposed to fly that Lima flag? Cheers to all you fisher poets out there, and I uh, can't wait to see you guys next year in Astoria uh, for real, in person. And up next, I have, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce a young fisher poet. Her name's Katrina, Katrina Peavy. She lives next door. I've known her since she was a baby. Uh, she comes from a fishing family. Everybody in her family fishes. Her sister, her brother, her dad or mom grandma. or her grandma or grandpa or uncle and uh, she's also a great writer. She spent the last 10 years in England so you might notice she doesn't really have an Alaska accent. <laughs> so please welcome Katrina Peavy. Thanks and cheers. Cheers. Yeah. I'll take that. <laughs> well thank you so much for having me um, and it's really good to be back. And just so everyone knows, uh, me and Doug have been vaccinated. And I also might add, I'm really happy to be in your kitchen and not the principal's office. So, <laughs> um, so last month during a community cleanup um, that I was participating in with Doug and Cheryl, um, I looked to my left and I saw an old, uh, an old family friend pull up. Uh, he was a passenger seat in a truck driven by his best friend, Von Skinne who was taking care of him during the last days of his life. And his name is Rick Summers. His nickname is Too Tall. And so this poem is dedicated to him and it's called Short Hello, Long Goodbye. Fall beside the passenger into a fading midwinter day. Memories encompassing an old salt, peppered white and ashen gray. Light flickers, recognition revs, palms raise and lifelines extend. In the space between short words exchanged, a prickling pause nicked the side. Something else left unsaid, something waited behind heavy eyes. 20 years had come to pass since tall eyes tied up next to mine and had I seen India's flag lowering half mast what words might have bit that tagline? Tell us a tale of long ago, of a brother and two sisters racing along the groove dock. Carry us back to yesterday, back to childhoods long lost. Tell us about elemental ways of old, of favorite spoons and secret spots. Carry us back to yesterday, retie braided lessons before they snap off. 
carve reminders of Babylonian bone, to pluck strings of this beating heart. Let us settle into its steady rhythm. Tell us of home before you depart. What was it like, the Alaska you loved, this great land steadily waning away? What was it like, the Alaska before? How can we protect this heart from pain? Remember another time on rock, before old growth was chipped and shorn, before salmon streams were mined for fool's gold, the balance severed from the norm? Or what if sequined moments weighted upon Lady Justice's silver scales, lowering us beneath the surface, hooking wisdom to swell our sails? Let me pierce that prickling pause, release what belies the locked sigh, turn past keys to unlock tomorrow for our long goodbye is nigh. And before you follow the liquid gold road towards the setting celestial sun, before you lift your hand one last time and bid farewell to loved ones, dip your pen in Chinook's ruby red, ribbons tying whispers to whistling wind. Tell us what the future holds, how merging currents ripple and spin. Let us fall beside your memory a little longer into the quickening night Stars drifting from bracken skies to guide our vessel and set our course alight. Thank you very much. I hope everyone has a good fishing season. And if you stop in Myers Chuck, say hi to my grandparents, Steve and Cassie Peavy for me. Give them a, a well, a COVID safe hello. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Katrina and Doug. That was great. Love those visual aids. That was that was terrific. You guys are a good team. And boy, Katrina, that poem with that question, what was it like the Alaska before? I think I'm sure we all have wondered that and you captured it so beautifully. So thank you for those lovely poems. Next up, we have Alana Tensuka Samiento from Portland. And I hope I got close on your name a lot. I didn't get a chance to ask you the pronunciation, but feel free to correct me. And go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. You're going to give us some music, right? Yes. And that was a pretty good run, Holly. Um, yeah, Alana Kansaku Sarmiento, um, six seasons in Bristol Bay, Black Lives Matter, Land Back, and uh, The Strengths of the Tides is hers also. Thank you, Elma. And thank you everybody who helped put this together this year. Needless to say, I miss you all as well. Um, I'm gonna do a couple pieces, original pieces for you folks. If I could have my way, I'd be fishing every day, pass the time away upon the sea. Morning, noon, and night, I'd be finding my delight, casting out my net upon the wall. Shimmering and green, every fisher person's dream Floats among the foam and rising waves Net the biggest prize, and with stars locked in our eyes Bring on home the money and the glory Still and ever clear, shallow waters draw us near We reach to break the surface of the sea Hands reach out to grasp, but the catch is much too fast, promising to live another season. Heavy, loud, and gray, unrelenting comes the day, trapped between our livelihood and home. No photos, phone, or mail could free or could avail, a longing for a lover's warm embrace. white and blue our hearts are holding true the waters hold the promise of our dreams air and salt to meet on our faces as we greet the vast and ever-changing great horizon if i could have my way i'd be fishing every day pass the time away upon the sea morning noon and night i'd finding my delight, casting out my net upon the water. Thank 
thank you. And my next piece will be spoken. <clears throat> I think women are getting into the industry because hydraulics are making the job easier, he said. I thought, your daughter fishes. Is that really what you think? You don't think it had anything to do with the fact that we were told for centuries that our place was in the home where the laundry is laundered and the babies are born and the meals and the beds are made, that we were too fragile, too pure, too coveted, too weak to put ourselves out in the world with all its dangers. Much better that we weather the dangers of the home where all we have to fear are our partners and our depression rather than the sea with all its brute uncaring. Uncaring about what your strengths or weaknesses are, uncaring that you have a family at home to feed, to return to, uncaring about what's in your head or between your legs. Rather than the sea, where the growing presence of women might cause men to fear obsolation more than drinking the deep. I thought, you're correct about the benefits of hydraulics, of all the technologies that allow us to work more efficiently with less effort, the technologies you race to employ. I wonder why all you have to say about the rising tide of feminine bodies and energies in the industry is to signal what you consider our weakness. I wonder why you don't have anything to say about what's gained. Is it because you don't see it? Because you don't want to see it? The way we use our brains to solve problems before we start lifting? The way we strategize? The finesse with which we lay our gear like sweeping arms? The vulnerability with which we communicate? The goddamn charm, the disarming, the care, the play, the resoluteness with which we approach the same filthy job. On the contrary, some of us have learned to imitate your motions, to walk the same way, lift the same way, talk the same way, spit the same way, just so you can be made to feel more comfortable. Even the most macho among us is very likely employing all the testosterone in her body for the sake of coddling a man, which is, ironically, an insanely female thing to do. Keep the men comfortable. If you can't do that by staying in your assigned role, then you must assimilate, transform into something he can recognize so that he will not be confused or challenged. Do nothing to threaten his worth. I thought, you don't understand that your worth is highlighted when we work together, as is mine, that our differences complement each other that we can lift together, that I can lift alone, that we can cry together, that you can cry alone. Yet all you can say is that the only reason I'm doing your job is because a hose and some oil has opened the door wide for the weaker half. I thought it, but I didn't say it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alana. Powerful music, power, beautiful music and powerful words. Thank you for telling it like it is. And, and as Doug said earlier, I too am so grateful for all of these powerful young voices like the one that we just heard. Thank you. Next up is Josh Wisniewski from Sitka, Alaska. So Josh, if you're here, I'm here. Okay, good. Please say a few words about yourself. We'd love to hear from you. Okay, I'm actually not from Sitka. I was living there in 2019 when I was trolling and came down, I, I guess, for Fisher Poets that year, but I'm back home in Seldovia now and um, I have set net sites here and I fish halibut here and jig. So I'm a skiff fisherman and uh, I'm gonna read three poems. I'll try to do short and sweet. Uh, this first one's probably for Doug since he likes old timers like me. All right. Uh, salty old timers don't bother with the cafe in the morning. They hold court at McDonald's. Oop, went full screen on myself. They hold court at McDonald's and keep the 30 year old conversation going. Well, this season was shit and management doesn't have a clue. And I've seen at the store, they've got organic beef selling for more than King salmon. That ain't right and processors aren't paying enough. But there's only 26 fish delivered last period, and it's been spotty with lots of shakers too. 
Well, it's winter. I just tied up the boat and I'm out trapping Martin now and I got four last week. But it's hard to call it winter because it's December and the mountains are still mostly snow free and forget about snowpack this year. Oh, and you guys hear about this blob 2.0? Oh, for Christ's sake. Well, black cod's going gangbusters, but they're too small and peacod crashed in the Gulf and they shut down federal waters. But they're getting some around Kodiak still and somehow the halibut quota in 3A got a bump. But with all the small fish last year, it sure didn't see that one coming. Yeah, climate change is a fucking bitch. Finishing my number four sausage, egg, and cheese breakfast meal, I dip my head and quietly bow to these revered old masters. Don't worry, kid, they'll show up. The oil-stained bodhisattva wisdom of romantically optimistic grumpy bastards. Nodding, I get up and walk down to the boat. Uh, next one. Uh, I guess it's about myself. Getting off the ferry and shuffling through the crowds down south again on a work trip. And the forever outsider, the observer, always and everywhere. And that was before ethnography and grad school and debts and breakups. And looking around at all these other people walking off the ferry with clean clothes, khaki shorts and button down shirts and sandals and cool backpacks and water bottles friends and families and cars and money. I know I'm not like that. And I'm not even been away a day and I'm already wondering if they're catching back home. And flipping through the tide book, I think about where I'd set. And I imagine the bottom and how the fish move around the rock piles in the current of a minus 0 0.07 tide, which will be tomorrow at 5.53 PM. What's wrong with me? Did I just never learn how to grow up or to be a real adult with ambitions? I mean, all my clothes are stained in epoxy and fish blood and outboard oil and my wool jacket's torn and patched and my hat's the color of dirt and smells like chainsaw sweat and halibut. I'm more comfortable sleeping by the wood stove in my cabin than in a real house with water and couches and TV. It'd be better just to stay up north, keep living on dried kelp, smoked salmon and halibut and digging for butters and hunting octopus and collecting coal off the beach while studying the currents. At night, light from the stove in the banya flickering and dancing on rough spruce planks as bodies sweat together in hot steam. But maybe it's just like Nancy says, that's just my suchness and maybe that's okay. So I'll let the emails and texts go unanswered and joyfully embrace the impoverished wealth of life of this place that's beyond the world of red dust, the place the Denina call where the spruce extends out. Um, and then my last one, this one's about halibut. Um, made a short set outside the mouth of the bay, off the island and lined up off the point. Two skates, just a hundred hooks, hand pulling. After 10 empty hooks, I feel your tug. You, the one who swims against the current, rises from 30 fathoms and looks up at me, slightly puzzled or perhaps angry. This guy? No one sets here. I get it too, because I'm just as surprised. I watch you just below the surface of the water and I feel a pang of sadness for the life I will extinguish. But don't get me wrong because I embrace my contradictions and I'd bow down and sell my soul to Mara for a thousand pounds of quota share and don't think that I wouldn't. I whisper a prayer, sink my gaff into your head and ask you to call on your brothers and sisters. Then legs braced against the side of the boat and waiting for the right swell, I sling you aboard. Shocked at this rapid change of circumstance, you fling yourself against wooden bin boards, but it doesn't help. You stare up at me as I slit your gills and your life force drains out in dark blood running across the decks. And I bow out of respect, thankful for the gift to one so undeserving. And I rip out your guts and watch as gulls feed on them. Okay, that's it. <coughs> Wow, Josh, that was a powerful ending to that poem. I think we're all still in that image. You you brought it to us so beautifully. And I love the line in the earlier poem about the description of the old timers as diesel stained bodhisattvas. Thanks for, for that wonderful reading. Next up, we have Gary Keister, who is actually a neighbor of mine I, in Port Hadlock. And I always love listening to Gary's stories and poems and, and so appreciate his good work in my community. So take it away, Gary. Well, thank you, Holly. And thanks to all of 
the people who put this together, I know it's been a, a difficult year and a real challenge to make such a wonderful production. Uh, I'm one of the older guys. I started uh, fishing as my grandfather's cabin boy when I was eight years old and uh, I've never lost the love of the sea. And so these poems are taken from years of, of sailing primarily. So the first one is Salmon Saner. Flood tides pulling strong and hard, nets heavy. Early gold sun shadows glisten off scraggly Sitka Cypress. Crew up before dawn, defying bone chilling glacier winds blowing through layers of wool and rubber. The icy black sea displays no trace of life as crewmen pull ferociously on strained hemp lines, the saner heaving and groaning. The crew tugs at the web as it rolls over the steely paretic power block, swinging precariously from atop the boom. The tall lanky kid balances gracefully on the edge of the turntable, meticulously stacking Spanish courts in perfect symmetrical rows. Out 50 fathoms, a sockeye jumps along the cork line as dozens fin in the sane's heart. The quicken of the motions build and a silvery salmon emerges killed in a mesh. Then another and another tension mounts. As the bunt end is dragged aboard, all hands rush to the bulwarks. There are thousands, a silver horde of the finest blood red sockeye. Are you hearing me? Yep, you sound great, Gary. Okay. Uh, the second poem is uh, Grand Back Then. It was grand back then, those post-war 40s, where life was steady in that closely knit island fishing village. Still today, it's comforting to return traveling through rich soil Skagit Valley, crossing the Swimmingers Slough and driving down the avenue called Commercial, where the air is fresh and the sea salt scent all consuming. Oh, the familiar smells of childhood long gone, save my well of memories. I wander the tired, abandoned, weather-beaten cannery, its wet red paint faded a dull blush after decades of battering by harsh salt and wind-driven seas. Vividly I see and smell the fresh sockeye being unloaded at the cannery dock as tons of seawater bathe their sleek blue back bodies. Conveyed to worn wooden bins, tall and tawny young men in tattered yellow rain gear shovel crystal clear ice over the precious cargo. In the dimly lit fish house, the stink of blood and guts where the glorious creatures are butchered and sliced, while old bent women in black and blue kerchiefs hand pack the blood red meat into half pound cans. The clinking tins move noisily towards the click, click, click of the relentless steel gray seamers, then stacked aboard rusting metal pallets and shoved in asbestos-coated, tomb-like chambers, the cookers discharge a shrill-sounding, scalding, sizzling steam. Penetrating the high-pile tins, cooking the hearty flesh, yet preserving its appreciated crimson color, and the village smells delicious. My last poem is called The Ebb. He visited the rock on the stormy, stony shoreline as long as he could remember. It never appeared to change, yet it did. 
little by little as each ebb and flood, as harsh seas whittled out the perfect pew for a boy and a granddad. Now he gazes solo, regarding the curling white water whispering beneath his black hip boots, recalling how the sea had fashioned him, sailing with the old man from Puget Sound to the Gulf and out west to the unrelenting Bering Sea. Now the water flows deliberately away as life ebbs one particle at a time, evoking life's marvels and the significance of the coarse grain granite hosting the tiniest bits of life that encrusts body and soul. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Boy, another powerful reading and, and your descriptions are just so vivid. You just brought me back to my first summer in Alaska working in the Petersburg cannery with that that description. So thank you again. And that last poem especially was really stunning. Okay, next up, we've got Brad Warren from Seattle. And um, most of you may know Brad is also the director of Global Ocean Health. And I hope some of you were able to attend his session this afternoon. They're doing great work trying to um, preserve the fisheries in the face of all the challenges that we're facing. So can't wait to hear from you, Brad. What have you got for us? I've got a piece called The Great Fisher Poets Brawl. I had some fun on this one and I had some uh, real fun with a co-writer, uh, Jeff Cars, who's been here a number of times too. Um, so uh, I'll just plunge in and uh, with apologies to all concerned. Um, <laughs> Willie drained his stout and took the mic and stared at the crowd. Call yourselves Fisher Poets. Well, I'll be picking you clowns from my teeth. Gonna read or just duck behind your beer like a snapper in a reed. That's enough, squirt. Mind your place in the food chain, growled Big Pat. You can't eat the Fisher Poets. They're the reason we all came. Clem Stark raised a hand in the air. The room fell to a watchful hush. Clem took the stage like a rattler takes his lair. Might be just a trick of light, but some folks claim they saw lightning in his hair. The old builder of poems planted himself in front of Free Willy. With a crafty smile, no one could read. One part kindness, one part switchblade. Then he spun to face the crowd. Fisher poets, now's your time, don't be a tease. No pushing, no shoving, no biting, no spitting, please. Mo Bow Stern was first to rise. She looked Willie up and down. What makes you so free? You flying low? Or is that just the breeze fluttering your britches? They say, hey, how come those britches are so frilly? You ain't dropped a load in your pants yet. Well, you will, Mr. Willie. Well, that's when the melee busted out through the smashed up chairs and the fists and shouts. The flying lasso sailed the room and it yanked Mobile Stern off the stage. And a tall cowboy, more mustache than face, leapt up to the mic and man, he looked and raged. I can't let a woman show me up. I'm the best there ever was. Nah, you're just a harpoon. Big Pat hurled him clear through the saloon. And even now, the great fisher poets say they can still see his boots sticking out the glass. If you get lost, just look for the long line of Astoria cowgirls waiting to kick his ass. Well, Free Willy took in the sea of shouts and fists, and he just could not resist. 
y'all got some fine words that don't hang a broom in the rigging. You were just in a bull sea lion barreled in and it pilled pin free willy to the floor. You smell good, you my favorite little Harry. Hey, that big tusk bull was in the mood. A flash of black and white broke the spell. Big as a rail car. The killer whale came for food. Gnashed in teeth like a row of spear points. You got sea lions in this joint? Let me add them. That's my only wish. Why let a tasty pinniped steal your fish? Well, this Stella slunk out the back, and a guy named Broderick finally stood. He stepped up to the pearly rack. He said, I just got a few words, so listen good. Thanks for clearing out the riffraff. Now I need you to watch the door. You can have the sea lions, but don't eat the fisher poets. They're the reason why we're here. Don't eat the fisher poets. They're the reason why we're here. Oh, Brad, that was terrific. <laughs> Thank you. I, I hope I don't regret it too bad, but uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the chance to be here. Thanks for pulling us all together. You bet. Well, thank you for um, just reminding us of what what a great family we have. I loved hearing about Clem, especially since he can't be here tonight, and Mo and Ron and all the Fisher Poet family. So thanks again, Brad. Okay, next up, we've got Megan Gervais from Homer. And Megan, if I didn't announce, pronounce your name correctly, please correct it. Um, you were pretty close, Megan Gervais. And I have Ruby and Mazzy here with me. Right. My kids, um, really the biggest joy of my life is being able to fish with my kids. And um, our set tonight is focused around that. So first thing is um, just something I threw together today, feeling a little intimidated to talk in front of you all. This is Courage Poem. If I can point the bow out the channel and beat into the waves stacked up steep and close by 25 knot west wind against ebb, then throw one out in the breakers, green water crumpling over the stern as we haul a heavy net. If I can do these things, then I can stand here in front of you and speak these words. Ruby, are you ready for yours? Come back. Ruby's gonna read one. One of the best things about fishing with kids is that they help, they start to help with stuff. And now I've got this kid that can help me, help me read. So this was a collaborative poem that we wrote together and Ruby's gonna read it. You ready? Wanna start together? Okay, this is called Boat Kids. Out Put on, on deck, deck every set they're ready. Head on, gloves on, boots on, working steady. Picking fish, getting splashed, and it's blowing west 20. They don't care because they want their money. Hold the flashlight, run for tools, run the hydro sometimes. Tie it up, let it go, yee-haw, grab the line. Watch a nine-year-old outwork grown men. They'll show you how it's done and be in bed by 10. Lunk it on corks in one on leads. They'll make it look easy because it is, they said. Sriracha on their carrots. Legos out. Work done. Swimming every day at sunset. Having fun. That was awesome. Way to go, Ruby. Um, I loved listening to Alana um, read her last poem. Really hit home. Um, Alana's an incredible fisherman and an amazing person. I fished with her for a couple of years and she knows how to get it done better than most men I've ever fished with. Um, I, it just made me like reminisce about, there was this night in the Nushigak, now known as the night when um, 
there were so many fish and boats sank and the nets were so heavy. Anyway, we hauled our net and went to deliver and the crew was just so worked and Alana, like I could barely stand up and we were delivering, like she just pretty much did the whole delivery and um, it was just wretched weather and so many fish. And <laughs> um, we pull away from the tender and like, the, it was just, she and I delivered cause the other guys were just done. And she's like, okay, we're gonna go make another set. And sure enough, we did. We, we set it out and drifted out the channel, like out into the dark and loaded up again. So thanks for that, Alana. Um, that was a total little sidebar that I was not planning on doing, but I couldn't help it. Okay, we've got one more quick one about kids. This is about my son who also fishes with me. He's not here. Okay, turning point, grumbling, mumbling teenager, won't wash dishes, won't wash down, scowls at the waves and swears under his breath and above it, puts on heavy metal and wishes for a cell signal. Mom is such an asshole. This stupid boat, this stupid ocean. Then that night on the South Line, blowing West 20 and the Hynotic sender came off in my hand as we left the tender in a shower of glycol on a big ripping ebb, full throttle and unable to shift. How we got the anchor down safely, I still can't remember, but it wasn't the full share guy racked out and oblivious. It was the teenager who got it done. So um, last of all, we have a little ukulele song. I'm fairly novice at the ukulele, but this year as um, a strategy to combat a little anxiety that I get before openers when it's really busy and crowded and there's lots of boats and I'm looking for a place to put my net, I've started strumming the ukulele. And sometimes these people sing along with me. This is a very short song. You should act like show me the way. You should act like I got something to say. Look you in the eye, fish don't lie. You should act like I voodoo, voodoo, fish old friend, fish I'd say. You're the best fish that ever laid an egg. Sometimes one, sometimes two, sometimes enough for the whole crew. All right, that's all we got. Thanks, everybody. Oh, thank you, Megan. And thank you to Ruby, your whole family. That was just a terrific collaboration. Oh, I just love that and love the ukulele too. So, so glad you were able to join us. I'm, I'm really wonderful. I look forward to seeing you in person next time. Okay, next up we have Joel Miller from Portland. And um, Joel has a song for us as well, I believe. Yes. I do. Uh, gosh, thanks everybody that's gone before me. Um, everybody that's put this together. Um, I, uh, I started fishing in 1992 and um, fished for several years up in Kodiak. And this song is about fishing on the Shelikoff in the winter. Um, and uh, somehow John Broderick found me in mid 2000s in, in Portland and uh, got me involved in this. And I thought I had lost my connection, but uh, I've been uh, reunited with a lot of people I know and met amazing people along the way. So thank you all for uh, what you do. And uh, this song's called Shelikoff. <laughs>
of gold and green framed against this restless vessel is haunting as a dream and I can hear the sirens call over wind and weird Hold steady, course my captain, the rocks are surely near, oh the rocks are surely near, and I watch the elk come down defeated light. All that's exposed is taken by the tide, the highs and lows of loving in my life. You look at me with no disguise. Albatross's wing Framed against This farming ocean The good luck It may bring oh, The good luck It may bring And I watch The elk come down The feeded light all that's exposed is taken by the tide, the highs and lows of loving in my life. I look at you with lover's eyes. I look at you with love.
Thank you. Thank you, Joel. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Sorry, my dog is barking in the background and I can't do anything about it. So I think she's just clapping for you. Um, let's see. Next up, we've got Toby Sullivan. And Toby has been a longtime Fisher poet. He hails from Kodiak, Alaska. And you've got a good, um, a powerful reading in store for you. Welcome, Toby. Hi, Holly. Hi. Am I? Oh, I guess you can hear me. Okay, good. Yep, you're good. And a big shout out to Joel. I knew Joel when he first started fishing in Uganic Bay about a million years ago. So that's good. And a big 100,000 kudo thank yous to the tech team that made this possible. I was a little skeptical a few months ago, but it's going fabulously. And I think I'm pretty impressed. So here goes. This is a kind of a send off letter to someone that's heading out to the Bering Sea. It's called The Things You Need. You need Goodyear extra tough boots, two pairs for when the ankles get holes from being folded down to dry, two sets of orange Grunin's rain gear, jacket and pants. Dutch Harbor gear is okay too. They even have pockets now, but the hoods on the Heli Hansen jackets are too small for some guys and the dark green color is invisible at night in the water if you go over, if anything happens. Nothing from West Marine will last one good day. And if it looks like something you'd wear in a sailboat, forget about it. Even on the reinforced Grundens, the knees will go out in a few weeks, climbing into the pots, climbing up on the stack, hefting 100 pound coils of line into the pot with your knee. The crabs will grab the cuffs, the sleeves will catch on the corners of pots, the picking hook will tear the sleeve off the shoulder and it will happen a minute after you walk out on deck in a brand new jacket, the smell of orange plastic fresh in the wind, the $70 price tag still flapping on the collar as you tear it off in disgust. You need neoprene wristers like the sleeves of a diver's dry suit, at least two pairs so there's always warm ones in the dryer, a couple dozen cotton glove liners, a case of green neoprene gloves, $100 a dozen, with the long cuffs that go up under the sleeves of your rain jacket so the water runs down your arm and off your fingers. You need them because the dryer will make them brittle, because thousands of spiny opie crab shells will scuff the rubber off the fingertips, because a hundred miles of line will come out of the crab block every day and abrade the notch between your right thumb and index finger like a fast river cutting through soft rock. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the trip, half the lefts will still be under the, will still be in the drawer under your bunk and all the rights will be trashed in a box in the entryway. And you will pick through them every morning looking for the ones with the smallest holes. You need a wool stocking cap, though it will get wet and freeze and weigh so much your neck will hurt. A military tank helmet liner with a little strap that snaps under your chin for your ears in February working up against the ice pack in the Pribilovs. A neoprene face mask for when it gets really cold, when the ice fog starts moving across the water in those spooky little wisps. An insulated Mustang suit for working on top of the crab pot stack in the wind, for chopping ice off the rails, for setting the anchor two in the morning behind St. Paul when it's blowing 50. Make sure it's the kind with the inflatable collar that has a mouth tube to blow it up that will keep your head out of the water if anything happens. And a CO2 cartridge that goes off automatically, hopefully, if you are unconscious, if anything happens. You need lots of hats, build caps with the logos of bars and canneries and equipment companies. Sometimes hats are lucky, but you will not keep them. They will blow off in the wind when you look up at Coast Guard C-130s going over get ground up in the bait chopper by your friends for a joke, dropped between the dock and the boat while drunk, taken by girlfriends for souvenirs, lost. You need a pair of uptown jeans for the elbow room, a set of Carhartts for doing gear work in town. Thick polypropylene socks, all of one pattern, 
so your knee, so you know where whose are whose when they come out of the dryer. Felt boot liners, those little blue booty inserts, sweatpants and hooded sweatshirts. Enough to always have a dry set to put on. Lots of cotton t-shirts for changing out of between the strings of gear when you soak them through with your sweat. Underwear. You need a knowledge of cookery. The ability to know how to change the oil in a Caterpillar 3298, an appreciation for dawn, a respect for night. Books about anything, money, your toothbrush, extra strength Tylenol, knee pads, a Walkman. Jimi Hendrix for good days and Hank Williams for bad ones. Paper for letters, stamps to mail them. A calling card for the phone on the dock in Akatan. The numbers of people who will answer that phone late at night, who will listen to you breathe when you forget what you wanted to say, who will know without being told. Pictures of those people, a calendar, the memory of dry land, summer, trees, and the smell of your woman, a piece of her clothing in case you forget, your plans for the future, and a plane ticket home. Thank you, and I'll see you all in Nestoria next year. Thank you, Toby. What a great list. Boy, that I, the line about the wristers, oh, <laughs> that's so great. They're never together. So um, wonderful. That reminds me a little bit of a poem that Smitty used to read. Um, yeah, it was just nice to think about all those, all the things we need, and then all the intangible things too. Thank you. Next up, we have, let's see, Katrina Porteus coming all the way from Northumberland, England. And this is one of the advantages. We, we, we know we're missing seeing each other in person, but we're really glad that Katrina is able to join us tonight. Welcome, Katrina. And it's really, Thanks. it's early in the morning where you are, right? What time is it? It's uh, 20 past five. So thanks, Holly, and thanks to everyone who's put this together. This is just amazing to be part of it and such an honor to join you. Thank you. Um, here's, a, here's a picture I took this morning of, of uh, the village where I live, the harbor here. So just you get, get an idea of it. There's, there's not very much fishing left here now, but uh, I spent many years in the, really steeped in the fishing and on the boats and um, trying to record what I could of the, of the life here. So I'm gonna be reading some poems about that tonight. It was incredible. It's been incredible tonight to hear so many strong women fishers talking about their, their lives. Um, it's almost unheard of here for women to, to, to fish for a living. Although I went on the boats, I didn't fish for a living because women, women just didn't in my generation and, and still don't. But it's, it's, it's really good to hear that, uh, to hear of, of, of women fishers in, in the States. Um, I'm gonna start though with an excerpt from a poem about what the women did do because they were very strong here and the boats could not have gone to sea without them in the old days before my time when we had the long line fishing here. So this is just a little excerpt about those women. In the dark of the morn were pokes and sacks, bent to the mushels, creels, cotton were backs, heft them here to the crack at the skein, fingers fleeing like a sharp machine, dabs and sprags and git muggle haddocks for the two who are groomed. Hooks for the square to the steed and benty, 1400s mare at plenty, varnish slavery, half a family, cannot make a better of it, jiggered at 40. So, um, the fishing villages here, the women had their role and the men had their role and the men went off to sea and the women stayed at home and that was just how it was done. Um, but the women were baiting the long lines and they had their own culture and their own community uh, 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 here on land and they helped launch the boats because the, the men didn't want to go to sea wet so the women would be pushing the boats down the beach and all of that. and. Uh, I'm going to just read a very short poem now about um, a bird on the shore here called the eider duck. And the eider duck always makes me think about those women because um, the eider ducks, the, the, the male ducks go off to sea altogether and the female ducks 
create this kind of community where they all communally look after the ducklings. So you get about half a dozen eider ducks and all these little ducklings, about 30 of them all together. And we call these ducks cubby ducks or cuddy ducks because they were supposed to be um, St Cuthbert's favourite duck and St Cuthbert uh, lived just, just off uh, on an island just off, off the coast here. So this is cubby. Cubby, you're a bonny board, mild and our soft. Waller and doon the oozy, a seabeard feet, brune as an hard dopper. Are you no feared, rowling about the lippers or among folks? That much of him about the weirs, you've disappeared. Your heeds are wadge, your nebs are fid, ye snook and plodge among the bents, a heap of barky gear, biden quiet. Where's your man? Awa. Ah, but in me. Dadden like corky duckers, thought he strong, and ah, the bonny bairns, thrustle doing soft and sooty, ah, together, everybody's business. You're a hell village. So I'm going to finish um, with a poem about my old mentor and friend, Charlie Douglas. Can you, can you see him there? That's Charlie. Um, and this poem is called The Marks to Gambi. I asked Charlie what a fisherman must know. Ah, bloody things, he answered me. How so? A fisherman had to have brains in our one time. His fingers twisted round the slippery twine in the stove's faint firelight. It was getting dark. Them days, he said, we had to gun by marks. Stag at the fair and hoose, hebron beetle and trees. Thus he began the ancient litany of names, half vanished, beautiful to hear. Gun ruined the point, keep Bamber Castle clear, the black rock mind. Of Newton, steer until you've staggered level the nick of the broad mill. Novice, I listened. In the gloom, I saw the rolled up sail by the long unopened door, a traveller stiff with rust, a wood wormed mast, all the accumulation of the ancient past. Now keep the church on Alexander Hoos and Yon's road. Oh, Charlie, what's the use? I said. These memories, I know they're true and certainly they're beautiful. But how can you compete with all the science of these modern days? The echo sound has finished your outdated ways. Efficiency, that's what they want, not law. Why should the past concern us anymore? I couldn't see his face. The stove had died. There's Nain Crab's new, said Charlie sadly, and he sighed and seeming not to hear me, sealed the knot. When you see lippers coming, when to stop and when to gan, that's what you need to know. The sea's the boss. My father told me so. Them marks, he said. He handed ah them doon like right and wrong. Them beggars for the tunes. He sliced the twine he sewed with savagely. The divin now what's right? The gan to see their only minds for profit. They'll no give name thought to who their sons will have to live. I saw then, so I said, as we embark, the past is map and measure, certain mark to steer by in the cold uncertain sea. We leave it like the land, but all we know, what to hang on to and when to let go, leads from it. Aye, said Charlie, sick and so. Thank you and have a great fishing season. Thank you, everyone. Oh, thank you, Katrina. Wonderful to hear about fishing life in your village, in your town and in England and the ways in which it's so similar and the ways in which it's different too. I, I really love those pieces. I love learning about the eider ducks too. And that last line, what to, what to hang on to and what to let go. Those are resonant words. Now we're able to slip in um, an extra musician and not just an extra musician actually, but Mary Garvey, who I always think think of has the voice of an angel. So please welcome Mary Garvey. Thank you so much. I'll go fast. Um, I'll sing Do You Need Another Hand? It's based on a book called Salmon Fever by Lisa Pinner. And I'm not a fisher myself, but I've worked in various support roles to make a long story short. 300, maybe 50 more were lost this year upon our shore, but still they come to our back door. Do you need another hand? With cap in hand and eyes that plead, Mister, I've ten mouths to feed, and they are grateful, yes, indeed. Do you need another hand? 
Some are Serb and Russian Finn. They leave no wives or next of kin. The sea will wash the next crew in. Do you need another hand? They're ordered not to go that far, to stay on this side of the bar. But they'll go where the salmon are. Do you need another hand? They'll follow after fish and gull as long as there are nets to pull. And sometimes they are over full. Do you need another hand? They're buried where the waves won't reach on rocky hill or sandy beach with two to dig and none to preach. Do you need another hand? I dream at night while in my sleep of naked men lost in the deep. Their cries would make the angels weep. Do you need another hand? That's about the Astoria area bar. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, and thank you, Mary. What a wonderful taste. And just thank you so much for all of your sort of work as a historian in the area and the way you bring it alive in songs. So I'm really glad we could we could slip you in. And um, it's been really fun reading the chat. And I think, Katrina, there's consensus here that we need to find a way to bring you back in person next year. So um, we're talking GoFundMe sites even. Um, gosh, and I'm the last one. I get to wrap up. It's an honor to do that. Um, since I left fishing in the late 80s, Fisher Poets has really become my connection to the life I, I loved in Alaska. And over the past couple decades since Fisher Poets started, it's been really wonderful to hear more voices, especially some of the ones we heard tonight. I'm especially grateful for the strong voices of my sister Fisher Poets and even more grateful knowing that this isn't true in other parts of the world. I think in these more ever more challenging times, we need all our voices. I'm gonna read two poems. One is very old and one is pretty new. Um, just a little bit of quick background. I, Dave at Hartwick and I fished the Merry Maid in Southeast Alaska for four years. And then we ran tenders for four years in Prince William Sound, Togiak, and Bristol Bay. Um, so I'm gonna, I, I did leave gill netting. It was hard for me to, to kill a creature as beautiful as a salmon. And I used to read this poem at some of the earliest Fisher poets, and I thought it might be time to read it again. I've been thinking a lot about salmon lately as um, they are under pressure now from diminishing runs, under pressure from mining and logging, and of course, all the complexities of a warming ocean. Um, so this is this is ablution, and it takes place on the um, deck of a trawler. I went out with a friend, um, and this was written after after cleaning fifty beautiful king salmon in Frederick Sound on a, a sunny afternoon. Ablution from the trolling cockpit. I wish watched. You rise like a prayer to the surface, pull you from the sea, slide the hook from your jaw, your silver body in my hands, gasping in the shock of air. I lay the bowing arc of you on the plywood table to be cleaned. The cannery says I must bleed you while you're still alive. I slice an artery and your blood pools thick and red on deck, slit your long white belly, Pull out your luminous organs, heavy with herring. Stroke your scales, ask forgiveness. Sluice your belly with seawater until your bones glisten white and startled against pink flesh. And the water runs red, but your body knows still what to do, how to move in the bright water. Down I lay you on the wet deck, empty and shining, and the wing of your tail strokes the wood as you swim away into air, a silver river of memory longing for the sea. 
I haven't read that in a long time. And it's funny how just reading it brings that day back so vividly. And I think that's that's really the power of, of poetry and music. And that's why we do this. So my second poem is from a, my most recent collection, Hold Fast, which came out in February, almost a little over a year ago today, right before the pandemic. And um, I think you might recognize a few of the images that were inspired by my fishing days. It's called Credo. Make a place for the glint in the seal's eye that second before he rolls back his slick head, slips silent beneath the surface. Make room for the shimmer of salmon, splitting the sun, leaping for the stream of her birth, even knowing what's ahead. Carve out a corner for the crab who grasped the blade of the cleaver that sliced him in two, wouldn't let go. That light, dazzling dark sea ahead, remember it. Remember how it seeps from billowing cumulus when you least expect, or how the sun finds the crack in the horizon solder to empty out its cargo at dusk, a slick sheen across the water. How the green spinning earth and the blue brimming sea go on and on, even when we're not looking. And that perhaps if we can pay attention for even a second, remember just this, it may not make us whole, but it could be a good place to begin. And I wanted to say before I read this poem that really one of the great gifts of my fishing years were that I think they really taught me to pay attention, that we had to pay attention. You never knew what the weather was gonna give you. And that it's really a, a habit of mind that I'm really grateful for um, many years later. So thank you. And I have the pleasure of wrapping up and I think we're almost on schedule, just a few minutes over. Thanks to everybody for hanging in there with us. Thanks to all of you who are still there. So let's just have a hand for the performers um, this evening, both first set and second set. Just, I know you're out there clapping with me. Good, good, it's great to hear you. And thanks to everyone for joining us, whether it's just this set or the whole weekend. We sure hope that you can, we'll be able to see you in person next year in Astoria. But before we end, I'd like to have a final shout out to Amanda and her crew. She's been like the Wizard of Oz back there behind the screen doing all the work. So Amanda, we want you to come out and take a bow. Um, <laughs> please, there you go. So kudos, big hand for Amanda. <laughs> Thank you guys. It was just an amazing honor to be part of this. Such beautiful performances all three nights. Thank you so much. Yes, and thanks to your crew too, Jamie Doyle and Megan Kleibach. So you guys are terrific. We couldn't have done this without you. So thank you again. And um, thanks to everybody. I'm going to turn it over to John Broderick for the final word. Hi, Holly. If John, well, yes, if thank you, Holly. Thanks, Hi. Amanda and Jamie and everybody. Doreen's with us we have felt like we've been with everybody as i'm sure you all have i i i hope you don't mind i had a little poem that uh i maybe would read just now because it reminds me of how i feel now i wrote it when uh my boy henry who's a veteran fisherman now when he made his first trip out there oh i don't know he was 10 or 12 years old it's called how to tell a good one it goes like this the new kid wears waders that come clear to his chin and a life jacket at his mother's wise insistence. When at the end of a long slog across the mud, we reached the skiff, Pete, his brother, a veteran of a dozen campaigns, hauls him aboard by the scruff of his gear. But the kid coils the line as Pete pulls the anchor. Nobody has to tell him. And as we set for the first time this season, he neatly throws clear a loop of lead line from a bin board snag. He pulls when we pull. He picks when we pick, making surprisingly quick work of your basic number one double gill on the bag side. 
he hardly touches the fish. And when we break at the water's edge, he's quick to the beach with a dip net, rounding up stragglers, and climbs back into the boat three times. Practicing, he says. At the bottom of the tide, we cut the skiff loose. Pete carves a tight turn at the outside buoy. The skiff pulls up easy along slide, alongside. I snag the trip line, tie it astern. Pete toes out and up until we like what we see and nod both. He cuts the throttle. I cast the buoy free. The boat drifts a moment in the lazy brown current and the blue two-stroke exhaust. In the bow, the new guy is watching. He hikes up his bibs, hooks his thumbs in his suspenders. What we just do, he wants to know. And that's what I feel like tonight. I feel like, what what we just do? Uh, I want to know. We just had a great weekend. Doreen and I spent three days in our living room with all of you. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> We, we don't know what happened, but it was great, and we had no idea it was going to be so great. Thanks to everybody who made it a great weekend. Uh, there's more good things that happened. When did we ever get to see uh, everybody? And that's just a, a wonderful thing. And, of course, uh, Amanda, we are uh, so grateful for you uh, making this happen with us. So thank you. We'll see you. Uh, we'll see you next year in Astoria, we hope. Jay, what do you want to tell us? Just thanks for coming, and uh, we're placeholders here. I think we're just going to keep this thing going, and it's really been great. Uh, hard to uh, see everybody go again. I mean, I guess we'll be a while before we see you all, but we'll be here, and we'll try and keep the fire burning. So it's been great. And uh, we'll be thinking about next year already. All right, all. Well, thanks. Keep riding. Keep fishing. Be safe. We'll see you a little later. God bless you all. Adios. <laughs>